Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Ferguson. I'm Professor of Divinity here at New College, and I'm glad to welcome you again in good numbers to the third in this series of Gifford Lectures by Lord Williams of Oystermouth. We heard on Monday about the Gifford bequest and the requirement of lecturers that they address the topic of natural theology in its widest sense. Lord Williams is fulfilling his remit admirably through his philosophical explorations of language which open onto wider theological terrain. What is perhaps less well known about the early history of the Gifford lectures is that the original stipend offered to visiting scholars was reckoned to be three times that of an average professorial salary in 1890. Not surprisingly, this enabled the new lectureships to attract to Scotland some of the leading scholars from around the world. And not much has changed since then. The stipends still appear to be pegged to late Victorian levels. <laughs> despite 130 years of inflation, but the good news is that the Gifford Lectures still attract some of the best scholars in the world today. Rowan Williams, whom I believe to be the most distinguished theologian of his generation, is no exception. And we are indebted to him for the amount of work that he has invested in preparing this lecture series. Tonight's lecture is entitled, No Last Words, Language as Unfinished Business. And I invite you to join me in welcoming Lord Williams back to the lectern. Well, it's very nice to think that scholars are becoming so more disinterested as the time goes by. Towards the end of David Lodge's satirical novel, Small World, the main characters are assembled in New York for a conference on literary theory. Everyone knows that their performance at this conference will determine whether or not they are plausible candidates for the coveted UNESCO Chair of Literary Criticism. When each has given his or her presentation, questions are invited, and the engagingly naive young Irish scholar, Perce McGarrigal, asks, what follows if everyone agrees with you? All are silenced, except for the aged Arthur Kingfisher, who has been devoid of any critical ideas for many years. <laughs> you imply, he replies, that what matters in the field of critical practice is not truth, but difference. If everybody were convinced by your arguments, they would have to do the same as you, and then there would be no satisfaction in doing it. To win is to lose the game. Well, it's a neat academic joke. The holy grail of academic life represented by the UNESCO chair, the impotent Fisher King of Arthurian legend, the innocent young Sir Percival, who's charged with asking the question about the meaning of the sacred objects displayed in the Grail Castle, and the healing of the king and his land that follows when the question is asked. All allied with David Lodge's quizzical but penetrating evocation of the complex byways of literary theory in the 1980s. Now, Kingfisher's response is cast in highly problematic terms. And actually, Peirce isn't wholly convinced about the answer, just that the question is important. The reply presupposes only the context of an academic discipline, a game that may be won or lost. And it takes truth and difference as mutually incompatible goals in this game. But the question could be addressed on a much broader canvas. What follows if everyone agrees is the cessation of the labor and difficulty of representing. The next generation of humans perceiving and interacting with their environment are under no compulsion to add anything to what has been said. All perspectives have, as it were, merged for practical purposes. We do not in any particular future generation need the unfamiliar voice or standpoint to enhance what we perceive. While we're used to arriving at a necessary degree of convergence in what is said, 
so that we have ways of mostly informally determining whether we mean the same, meaning the same is always a phrase that carries the shadow of actual articulated difference. Convergence is not just given, never complete, and always suggestive of new possibilities of divergence. It is not, with due respect to Arthur Kingfisher, that winning is losing the game, more that the victories of convergence establish the possibility of different games rather than just ending the one that you're playing. Now then, put this in slightly different terms, more or less familiar to philosophers. I say there is a mouse in the kitchen. You say there is a mouse in the kitchen. Do we mean the same thing? You can't be doing exactly what I'm doing, simply sharing information about what we might expect to see in the kitchen. You may be checking that you've heard correctly, probably with a small upward inflection at the end of the sentence. There's a mouse in the kitchen? You may be expressing shock at the news. There's a mouse in the kitchen? I'm terrified of mice. What does the cat think we pay her for? <laughs> or there's a mouse in the kitchen? I've just left a plate of toast on the table. I thought we got rid of the mice indoors and they were only in the garage. The environmental health people are due in 40 towers this morning. Notoriously, if someone else repeats what I've just said, that doesn't normally work as a guarantee that they have understood my utterance. Quite often it may mean the exact opposite. What do you mean by telling me this? What conclusions am I supposed to be drawing? If, to echo the phraseology of the last lecture, the relation between words and what we encounter or have to deal with were a stable one, to repeat the same words would be to say the same thing. But the fact that repetition doesn't guarantee understanding reinforces the point that there is a fluidity in the relation and the passage of time makes a difference. Saturday's performance of the school play is not the same as Friday's. The same words are said in the same order, with luck if everybody's learned their lines. You know school plays. But there will be differences, bound up with the fact that 24 hours have elapsed. When Tanya speaks her lines in Act Two, she is at some level aware of where she got a laugh last night, of the fact that her grandmother is in the audience tonight and will be shocked when she has to swear on stage, that she grasped for the first time last night why the other character on stage at this point reacts as he does, so that tonight she will be expecting his reaction in a slightly different way. And at a much more professional level, the conductor preparing to take the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields through a Mozart piano concerto will have digested a substantial discography, as well as all the performances he or she has heard, and knows perfectly well that playing the same notes as last time is no kind of account of what's going to happen. What is said, performed, enacted, becomes material to the next utterance or performance, so that this latter cannot be in any very interesting sense the same. Now, put these observations together with the fact that understanding an utterance or performance is in fact substantially a matter of knowing what to do or say next rather than being a matter of gaining insight into a timeless mental content behind or within what is said, it's being able to exhibit to the next step in a continuing pattern. Also, Wittgenstein would have us believe in a well-known passage in the Philosophical Investigations. That's 151 following. There he describes what happens when someone watching another person writing down a sequence of numbers suddenly grasps how the series is developing. Now I can go on. The principle of the series will be expressible in a formula, yet it's not simply, says Wittgenstein, that a formula occurs to the observer. Understanding is not in that sense a mental process, he argues, the summoning up of a key principle by conscious thought. It's more the skill in exercising a habit, the skill or confidence to go on to follow the series through, as he goes on to argue, it's like the experience of reading. When we read, 
we don't apply a procedure in our minds, a series of operations allowing us to move from seeing a sign to making a noise, or at least imagining making a noise. We just exercise a skill, a skill closer to knowing how to ride a bicycle than performing a calculation. So if understanding is knowing how to go on, how to follow what has been said or done with an intelligible next move, Linguistic activity is always going to be something that moves in time. There is an irreversible trajectory in language. What has been said cannot be unsaid, and what is now to be said has to reckon not only with the environment as such, but with the speech of others, which makes the environment we encounter always already represented. Put it slightly differently, the world we inhabit is already a symbolized world, a world that has been and is being taken up into a process of speaking. And what we say cannot be understood except as an event that requires further speaking, that requires following. What I articulate in this moment is a perception and perspective that confesses its own unfinished character by the sheer fact of being spoken in words that belong to an ongoing flow of linguistic activity. By being there, they can be echoed, agreed with, though never as we have seen simply or neutrally repeated, challenged, contradicted. They don't stand still as fixed tokens of the distinct objects they refer to. The challenge we've already discussed, moving from description to representation, is implied in the decision to stake a position, to venture a perception in language, knowing that what you say will not and cannot be the last word. And for all the attempts, whether in science, religion, or philosophy, to claim last words, language obstinately goes on doing something different. That phrase about staking a position is, of course, an idea ex explored particularly by the British Hegelian philosopher Gillian Rose in many of her works of the 1980s and 90s. And she will be returning as a presence on and off stage and some of the other things I have to say ahead. But just to give one more example of what I'm talking about. I heard many years ago a distinguished sculptor saying that he had discovered his vocation when visiting an art gallery in his teens. Predictable enough so far. But he said, I knew that there was something missing from that gallery, and it was my work. <laughs> the gallery had been showing a set of exhibition pieces designed to lead up to the work of Rodin. The teenage visitor had sensed that he knew how to go on from Rodin so that his work would be the obvious next step in a story. You could say that he didn't agree that Rodin should be where the story ended, but that doesn't quite add up to a rejection of Rodin, and that indeed was as far as possible from the younger man's intention. In his own terms, he had understood Rodin better than anyone who simply looked at Rodin as a phenomenon without any conviction that this was a story in which she or he belonged. Sensing a pressure to respond and continue is the deepest mark of understanding what is perceived in this context, not least because sensing such a pressure to go on implies apprehending what is before you as, in some sense, an address, an invitation. And while this sort of idiom makes reasonably obvious sense when we're talking about the intentional work of another human agent, we can recognize that there are analogies in the way we, re we react to the environment overall. The innovative scientist is impelled to ask the hitherto unasked question and propose the new explanatory structure or interpretative schema. It's not fanciful to speak here of a sense of pressure to continue and advances in sheer technical skill and sophistication allow such new questions to be heard and asked and dealt with. The simplest strategic development that allows us to solve a problem that might otherwise be lived with, a problem that doesn't absolutely have to be solved for our survival, reflects something of the same response. We behave as if this were an environment in which we were constantly encouraged to go on, 
to follow what has been said and done, which is inseparable from the recognition that we can't speak about ourselves without narrative, without the hinterland of allusion to the time it's taken to shape or establish what we now call a self. Richard Sennett, in his excellent and innovative book, The Craftsman, discusses at some length what he calls material consciousness, the entire complex process of transformation that unfolds in a tradition of making, a tradition of reshaping an environment. And he identifies three elements to this transformative pattern, what he calls the internal evolution of a type form, that is a generic structure for what's produced, which is repeatedly altering in response to failure, the process of judgment about mixture and synthesis, that is decisions as to whether blending different materials or binding them together works better in a particular context, and domain shift, the recognition of, I quote, how a tool initially used for one purpose can be applied to another task, or how the principle guiding one practice can be applied to quite another activity. Material consciousness, as he defines it, is that kind of human awareness which moves steadily through engagement with time and matter, accumulating experience, acknowledging connection, involved in what he calls a continual dialogue with materials. There is no sharp disjunction between seeing and doing. Once again, to understand is to be in a position to act, to follow, to do the next thing. Philosophy, says Senate, is readily persuaded that the observer's interpretative skill is somehow more important than that of the worker in materials, because we're always in search of what is not vulnerable to the change and decay of the material world. Yet the craftsman exercising the sort of material consciousness Senate sketches is in fact answering the question about permanence and impermanence in her own way. The three elements of material consciousness, he spells out, display what continuity in and through material difference might mean in practice. This, we could say, is analogy in action and our active inhabiting of the material environment as human agents is thus fundamentally characterized by this analogical skill set. Shifting domains, assessing techniques and engaging in continual dialogue. Well, more about the material context and character of intelligence in the next lecture. But the point of referring at this stage to Senate's discussion is to underline the irreducibly time-bound nature of the human sense of self. There may be some fashionable semi-philosophical skepticism about the continuous self, but it reflects a culture seriously out of touch with the kind of consciousness Senate is exploring reflects a culture marked by compulsive withdrawal into a world of symbols that can be endlessly exchanged and manipulated, symbols that have lost their anchorage in a genuinely representation-oriented and therefore a critical and exploratory engagement with the environment. Not to labour the point, this is manifestly part of the toxic fascination of playing games with virtual wealth that has threatened the economic viability of whole nations in recent years. But that might require another set of lectures as it requires another culture. <laughs> but to be aware of oneself as a self is to think of a continuing conversation with material data in the course of which, picking up that formulation of Cornelius Ernst, which has influenced so many theologians, in the course of which the world to which we belong becomes the world that belongs to us. Our practices furnish an environment whose shape both molds our activity and is molded by it. And the consistency of those practices is a central aspect of being able to see and speak of ourselves as subjects whose present capacity is made what it is by the accumulation of learning, of practices tested and altered, challenged and improved, and constantly extending in scope and domain-shifting flexibility. And as Senate himself hints, it's against this background that we need to think about thinking and about speaking. <laughs>
Speech, I've already noted more than once, is itself a material activity. Crucially, a practice which can be seen in terms of the material consciousness described by Senate. It evolves type forms, structures of representation that are reworked in the extended process of engagement with the environment and are subject to correction or enlargement. It operates a process analogous to what Senate describes as the discernment around mixture and synthesis, which characterizes material consciousness. That is, it recognizes some words and phrases as capable of more or less indiscriminate interchangeability and others as significantly and irreducibly diverse in meaning. It displays the capacity of domain shifting, importing images and categories from one area to another, using metaphor at level after level of reference and representation. <clears throat> Linguistic intelligence embodies that cumulative sense of self which emerges in the process of learning what viable interactions with an environment look like. And just as we can say that a particular product of material craft is admirable of its kind, even finished in its way, yet never the last possible thing that can be done in that mode, so with language, we can say that such and such a formulation, whether scientific or poetic, is finished, beautiful, well-formed, but we acknowledge that it is not and can't be the last word that will be said. In the case of a material work, the object made becomes a datum for the community of craftsmen and women. It suggests new possibilities. So too in language, what is said becomes a datum, allows something different to be said. And in the awareness of all this, what we call the awareness of self is born. We recognize that we have learned strategies for negotiating our environment, that we have encoded those strategies in the sounds we make and record, that such strategies are constantly being tested and are open to varying degrees of revision. What's more, such openness to revision is not just a matter of solving unexpected operational difficulties that arise, though that's undoubtedly part of the impulse. To quote Senate again, Simple imitation is not a sustaining satisfaction. The skill has to evolve. The slowness of craft time serves as a source of satisfaction. Practice beds in, making the skill one's own. Slow craft time also enables the work of reflection and imagination. The familiar theme recurs. The typical product of reflective apprehension of an act or utterance is not plain repetition. Such repetition is not yet, in the vocabulary we've been using, representation. Saying what has just been said, doing what has just been done, is not a good index of understanding. A craftsman who does nothing but imitate step by step what has been done will not yet necessarily have grasped the logic of the process which emerges only when the principles of the process are deployed to produce something different, even if only slightly. And the parallel with what has been extensively discussed in relation to language acquisition is clear. It's not, I think, entirely accidental that Richard Sennett, in addition to being a, a very distinguished social philosopher, is also a cellist of near professional standard. And to hear him speak about his experiences of learning the cello in that context bears quite um, illuminatingly on what he writes about craft. That's by the way. Well, all this leaves us with quite a mental challenge. To say that we can't avoid speaking about the self is not to say we must identify the self as some sort of object and to say that the self is not an object in space-time is not to say that it's a fiction. Perhaps it's more helpful to say that what we mean by mind-independent reality is itself indeterminate. To quote from William Downes's book on language and religion, the species mind seems compelled to some variety of realism, although it doesn't agree what, it ulti what is ultimately real. Speaking of a continuous self, lands us, it seems, in the realm of irreducible mystery. We can't dispense with the question of what warrants what we say, 
but equally we can't pin it down as an element or set of elements in the space-time world. There may be facts that warrant what we say, but they may be radically inaccessible to us, so Downs argues. With respect to mysteries, he writes, we don't know which can be naturalized, which can ultimately become tractable problems, and which will forever remain mysteries and are therefore in the permanent domain of philosophy, religion, and art. But I wonder whether Downs' own complex and finely articulated argument does entire justice to the point he himself grants so readily, that essentially temporal character of self-awareness and the consequent cumulative character of what we call knowing. If our habitual self-awareness is, as it has been discussed here, a matter of familiarity with an existing range of verbal and other strategies evolved for negotiating a path through the material environment, and if understanding is tied up with the sense of how to go on, how to follow, what does that open up for us? What more can we or do we look for? If we're looking for a way of identifying the real in a way that's somehow is detached from the continuing processes of representation, we'd be looking for a chimera. Is it not that simply this is how we display realism by the process of following what has been said and done in ways that are open to continuing scrutiny and revision? Rather than treating the question of realism in relation to what's actually there as a question we ought to be able somehow mysteriously to resolve, why don't we look rather harder at how our language itself operates and realize that this is what reference looks like when we are building on skills acquired and testing those skills repeatedly in the world that comes to us. We show that we are serious about extra mental reality by certain features of the behavior of our language, by the exposure of our representations to response and correction or expansion. We show our aim to be realists in discourse by the time we take in speaking. That's just to enter a little bit of caution about William Dunn's distinction between what's capable of being naturalized and what remains m mysterious. I think there's rather more to be said, but I'll leave aside the discussion of his very interesting book for now. I've been arguing that understanding is seeing that there is now something to be said or done, that there is a future for this particular line of engagement. Understanding, in other words, is very different from a definitive act of penetrating into the inner workings of an object so as to lay bare its essential mechanism, penetrating to the point where we can say, this is just X. When once we have articulated a response of any intelligent kind, we have both recognized something that we are accountable to in the world. We've denied ourselves the liberty to say what we like. And we've staked a position, a perspective that we now expose to challenge and possible revision. We've denied ourselves the security of claiming there is no more to be said. And I think those two self-denials are crucial. We deny ourselves the liberty to say what we please. We deny ourselves the security of claiming that there's no more to be said. What we don't know is not so much an elusive interior dimension of the world that escapes us. What we don't know is the range of possible relations in which an object stands or may stand, which means that the only way of augmenting or refining our knowledge is to go on, to continue the process of inviting further speaking. It's in this connection that we imagine the self as a necessarily time-related reality while at the same time recognizing that it can't be rendered as one object among others in the space-time continuum. To know myself or understand myself is to be involved in a narrative exercise. I don't look for a timeless true self at the heart of all I do or say, but I do look for a sequence of encounters that I can narrate in which specific ways of seeing my history became available for me and presumably specific versions of that history ceased to be available, versions that I now characterize as fantasy. 
So I can't sit down and decide that I'll embark on a search for my real self by thinking hard about what's essential to my mental life. I search for my real self, whatever exactly that term designates, by sifting through remembered narratives in which I identify my problems or failures as arising from self-deception or self-protection. I try to find the ways in which I have been in flight from reality. And to do this is normally something I undertake when I'm concerned that I may be falling back into self-deceiving or self-protecting habits. To be in search of myself is not looking for an object I have mislaid somewhere, which may be around somewhere. I may, in a strongly metaphorical sense, say something like, I'm not sure where I left my conscience on that occasion, but I don't think that a map will produce an answer. And the relation of time-specific statements to statements about my mental condition is unusual. I was sitting in the kitchen at the time is a different sort of statement from I was understanding myself at the time. Sometimes I say, of course, then I understood, or then I knew. But that's claiming that there was a moment when my awareness of my possibilities altered substantially, and I became able to think of a distinctive future. I wasn't saying that for a certain period I was engaged in something called understanding myself or knowing myself, as I might say that for a certain period I was sitting in the kitchen, with or without the mouse previously referred to. <laughs> Puzzlement over how I can know that my knowledge is not illusory is, as Stanley Cavell eloquently explains, an attempt to establish a connection between what I say and what is there when I have deprived myself of all the routine means of making such a connection. Here's Cavell. The reason we cannot say what the thing is in itself is not that there is something we do not in fact know, but that we have deprived ourselves of the conditions for saying anything in particular. That is, the search for the thing in itself is a search to escape from language. We can't talk about what something is like when we're not talking about it. We can't talk about an object in a way that avoids the staking of a position and the opening of an intelligible future of debate and exchange. We can't surprise the object when it's not expecting to be looked at. And this, in um, desperately condensed form, is, of course, arguably what the entire um, argument of Hegel's phenomenology of spirit is all about, but that, again, is a long story. It's not, to labour the point again, that there are unrepresentable realities that would ground what we say if only we could get at them. It's that the way we know and understand is by representing and risking the form of our representation in shared discourse as time unfolds. The self I may claim to know is always the active first person of a narrative. And the first person notoriously has as little of a clear location as the eye does in the field of vision. It's not an object for inspection. But neither is it to be characterized simply as a reality we cannot represent, a reality that if only we knew how to speak of it, we could, after all, locate in such a way as to justify truth claims about it. The truth is that we do, in some sort, represent the first person in the bare fact of continuing to put it where we put it, at the center of our narratives. What is the real self? It seems the only defensible answer in this context is to say the real self is the action that here and now gathers events narrated from the past and possible courses of action in the future into one story that is unceasingly being revised from one utterance to the next. It's an instance where the difference between description and representation, in the senses I've been using, is exceptionally clear. Now, the implication of locating the self firmly in this context of the passage of time is also, of course, to locate it in the processes of linguistic exchange that are initiated by a venture of understanding. To be a time-conditioned self is also to be a social self, a self formed in interaction. Who I believe myself to be is inseparable from what I have heard, the possibilities offered me in relation and conversation, consciously remembered or not, 
I may well and rightly insist with some vehemence that I'm not simply the sum total of other people's perceptions or projections. But of course, merely to say this is to enter the world of exchange, converse, challenge, and so on. And merely to say this is, I know where to locate the first person in vehemently protesting against the idea that there isn't a first person. Stanley Cavell argues in the monumental essay Between Acknowledgement and Avoidance, which makes up the final section of his great book, The Claim of Reason, that the apparently abstract discussions of skepticism and certainty in the philosophical literature of early modernity can be read as so many ways of handling the far from abstract question of what it is for me to see and to be seen, to know and to be known in the risky territory of personal communication. As he puts it, the question is, how do you let yourself matter to another human speaker? I quote, to let yourself matter is to acknowledge not merely how it is with you, and hence to acknowledge that you want the other to care, at least to care to know. It is equally to acknowledge that your expressions in fact express you, that they are yours, that you are in them. This means allowing yourself to be comprehended something you can always deny. Not to deny it is, I would like to say, to acknowledge your body and the body of your expressions to be yours, you on earth, all there will ever be of you. So he argues that the overcoming of skepticism is not a matter of some clinching argument to establish a state of affairs capable of grounding a rational belief in the reality of other minds or an external world. The overcoming of skepticism is something more like a discipline of speech and sensibility that persistently identifies and challenges our various strategies of retreat from being present in our words, our various ways of denying ourselves to others, from the risk denying the risks of being recognized. And to relate this more closely to the discussion of the present lecture, it's to acknowledge that the self now speaking is still and always a project. I set out in my words and acts an identity formed out of my history of interaction with other speakers and implicitly ask, am I recognizable? Am I intelligible? Is there a future for whatever it is that speaks from this position? Is what I'm saying the kind of discourse that can be replied to? But I think to examine our speech with that kind of question in mind does open up another way of seeing what it is to claim continuous selfhood. Am I speaking in a way that can be heard? To think of personal identity in terms of gathering and presenting what I hope may be worth recognizing and answering, of course, carries with it some cautions about other versions of identity that lead to serious conceptual and imaginative difficulties. If my selfhood is fixed at the point of utterance, then that utterance is in no sense a request for acknowledgement. There's a very interesting essay by the science fiction novelist Ursula Le Guin, where she gives examples of statements that do and don't invite an answer. I refer you to that for some interesting reflection on uh, just this, this question. If my selfhood is determined from outside, if, to think back to some of the arguments in the preceding lecture, it simply plays out a determined script, then I'm not in fact uttering at all. I'm performing an operation whose outcomes are in principle predictable. Either of these perspectives would be an avoidance of risk. An avoidance of the moment of self-abandoning uncertainty that's involved in actually saying who I am, in allowing myself to be comprehended, in Cavell's phrase, and owning my expression as mine. In the light of this, we can perhaps see how the unitary, continuous self both is and is not something in the space-time world. In one sense, it's certainly true to say that the imagined self, the stable terminus of all actual and possible experience for me, isn't an inhabitant of the world and not open to the sort of scrutiny I give to objects. I is not the name of a thing. But at the same time, we can say that it's very specifically a speaking body here and now, an agent involved in symbol-making activity, even in craft. By virtue of working with the symbolic accumulation of the past, 
with what has been understood and thus followed out in the sense outlined earlier, and by making appeal to the symbol-recognizing capacity of other language users in the immediate vicinity and ultimately further afield, I declare there is a self here, my body. Or rather, as Cavell puts it, the body of my expressions. And I commit myself by speaking and inviting a response to a continual time-taking development of the body of my expressions, the repertoire with which I seek to make myself present to others. I'll be coming back in the next lecture to discuss some of this in more detail. And our fascination with both narrative and ritual, including the rituals of drama and storytelling, reflects our desire to develop that repertoire, not only in the habitual exchanges of conversation, but in intensified forms. A narrative, perhaps especially a dramatic narrative, displays the way in which persons move and grow, acquire fresh dimensions to their self-presentations. But in contrast to our own narrative about ourselves, it will, if it's a good narrative, be charged with significance moment by moment, whereas our self-narration will have to select from a background of not obviously significant material. That's why Cavell, writing about drama, compares it to the directed motion of a musical composition. We don't know why it begins where it does or how it's going to end, but we're presented with a situation demanding our closest attention because the directedness of the motion that we witness means that every moment will in some way contribute to an outcome. The perception or attitude demanded in following this drama, says Cavell, is one which demands a continuous attention to what is happening at each here and now, as if everything of significance is happening at this moment, while each thing that happens turns a leaf of time. Drama highlights what we recognize to be true of our existence as human agents in general. The fact that our self-awareness is always awareness of a moment of transition as things move into an irrecoverable past and shape an unseen future. And while we may be watching a drama whose plot we know perfectly well, so that the outcome is not in doubt, we shall still be attending with the same intensity to see better how this moment opens and closes possibilities for the next and beyond, hoping as we attend to see something of how it is that people go on, follow what is said and done. When we see Hamlet or Cat on a Hot Tin Roof for the 10th or 15th time, we still attend. We are still interested in how exactly it moves from there to there, because we know that that's what it does at each moment. It moves intelligently. We're hoping to understand better human agency and interaction, hoping to see more clearly how and why this leads to that, and so to become aware of larger possibilities for our own going on in understanding. The dramatist or novelist proposes a pattern of temporal movement and transformation which I can recognize as in principle like what I am aware of living in. And in attending to this unfolding pattern, I am assisted to attend to my own narrative, perhaps to recover aspects of that story which I've ignored or buried, perhaps to read my actions or those of others with new questions, new suspicions, so that my decisions, and in particular my own utterances, are formed by larger and more various factors than hitherto. And ritual includes elements of drama, though it's not identical with it. Building again on definitions offered by Senate, we could say that ritual is repetitive, transformative, and publicly theatrical. It traces the same pattern of performance in different enactments over time. It makes ordinary physical stuff, including words and gestures, carry meanings that are not intrinsic to themselves. It involves us in performance that is about more than what happens to be in our individual minds. It has a nuanced relationship to the passage of time. Rituals are conserved over time so that it appears we're doing the same thing at different moments in time. And the time of the ritual itself provides a narrative sequence that doesn't vary. Yet the reason they are conserved is that they are believed to be pertinent to a constantly changing context of human action and utterance. To return again and again to a ritual form 
is to bring together my, our current situation, choices made or to be made, so as to allow them to be informed by patterns of intelligible act and speech, which are not directly conditioned by that present situation. In other words, the story of my or our current doings is located against the background of another and supposedly broader narrative canvas. When we join in a celebration of Remembrance Day, to be topical, we juxtapose our current lives with the record and collective memory of major international conflicts, so that issues around our corporate identity, our vision and our well-being are configured differently. When Christians join in a celebration of the Eucharist, they allow themselves to be interrogated by the story of Christ's self-sacrifice, to be questioned as to whether their present lives are recognizably linked with Christ's, and to be reconnected with the story of Christ's death and resurrection by the renewing gift of the Holy Spirit. So the awareness here and now of how my life or self is unfolding and my reflection on what I'm going to put out there in linguistic exchange to be recognized and responded to is all confronted and enhanced by a story whose form is already fixed, a story which has happened in such a way that my present options are extended or altered. Effective ritual is a matter of holding myself to account, not of retreating to a comforting alternative time track in which all the problems are resolved. So our speaking is always time-related. It's always incomplete in search of the perspective of another. It is characteristically engaged not only with other speakers in the same direct environment, but engaged with the more radical sorts of otherness represented by ritual and by fictional narrative or drama. Our speaking is in search of tools for the critique and enrichment of its repertoire, and quite often in full flight from such resources when they threaten to become excessively critical and unsettling. Speaking in a way that's conscious of the time-related nature of language requires a measure both of humility and of courage a mixture of reticence and bold affirmation, the staking of a position. In what ways does all this bear upon the affirmations, the language of religious faith? You might think that faith has an investment in finished stories and the avoidance of the kind of risk we've been thinking about. And there are undoubtedly varieties of religiousness that work in just that way. But this would be a monumental misreading of the issue. Because what we have been exploring in this, chap in this lecture is the implications of knowing that I am finite, that my thoughts and words are learned over time, that my utterances are open to the perhaps abrasive responses of others, that I do not have the resources as an individual to sustain meaning or honesty in my own practice alone. Choosing finitude, says Cavell, is the choice of community, of autonomous moral existence. A very provocative bringing together of two things that we sometimes think are intention, community and moral autonomy. But it means, he says, that to be an autonomous moral agent is, counterintuitively, to be an agent aware of choices that are real because they are limited, limited by the sheer thereness of others, limited by the factors that have, as a matter of fact, made me the agent I am, not to mention limited by living in a world of material limits. Adult autonomy, contrary to what is lazily assumed by a lot of our culture, is never the liberty to decide in abstraction, to decide in abstraction from what others are, from what others say. Adult autonomy is not, after all, the exclusive opposite of dependence. But this means that if we are to speak honestly about ourselves, we are committed to a more and more far-reaching investigation of dependence, an issue flagged in the first of these lectures. We are, as speakers, in search of the most dependable and comprehensive resource for our truthfulness and clarity. We're moving in the direction of something to which we can be unequivocally present, by which we can allow ourselves to be comprehended in the most extensive sense imaginable. 
if we are fundamentally and radically interested in being truthful and honest. The question is bound to arise, in the presence of what does that become possible? And the answer to that is not going to be something we can depict. To depict it would be to reduce it to the scale of what our minds can construct, to bring it down to the level, once again, of a thing among other things in the world. Even to represent it in the specialist, specialized sense I've been giving to that word is a complex and risky enterprise. We can say that it's the invisible end of a trajectory whose beginnings we can trace, the trajectory of exposure to an other whose presence both assures and challenges. And for such an other to be a presence that is not merely the presence of another interest, another point of view that itself needs assurance and challenge, it can't be reduced to being represented as a further item in the list of the things that there are. It cannot have interests that are in competition with the things that there are in the universe. Simone Weil famously said that she was absolutely certain that there is a God, in the sense that I'm absolutely certain that my love is not illusory. And equally, absolutely certain that there is not a God in the sense that there is nothing real which bears a resemblance to what I am able to conceive when I pronounce that name. And the implication of that searching remark is that to speak of a divine other is, an importance, is in an important sense more even than projecting an infinite line out of the trajectory we now discern. But at least we have a basis for some sort of linguistic representation insofar as we can talk about the imagined effect of another to whom we were unconditionally present, in terms of an unconditional permission to question and reimagine the self that we are, without any anxiety that the project would ultimately run out or terminally fail or undermine itself. To put it very briefly, it's the conviction that we are witnessed to. To live and speak from such a place of non-anxiety, non-anxiety because there is a witness, is one plausible account of what the word faith means. And it's the point of connection, I believe, between the process of repeatedly staking oneself in the incompleteness of language and the stability of faith itself. What is it then that is displayed in the actual phenomena of religious language? If religious language shows signs of working with difficulty, of having criteria for self-scrutiny and self-correction, it is certainly operating as if it were dealing with something mind-independent. And by the same token, if the search for what I call the most dependable and comprehensive resource for our own self-positing and self-questioning shows the marks of dealing with difficulty and reinventing itself in response to difficulty, we have at least to reckon with the possibility that we can't fully make sense of the temporal, unfinished, cooperative character of our speech without raising this ontological question. In effect, the question of whether we can in any way speak of what is not dependent, not originated, not an item among others in the universe. The question of being, if you will, as something other than the sum total or supreme exemplification of the existence we habitually talk about. And one thing that certain kinds of religious language do is to suggest that, paradoxical as it may sound, the best way of representing the unrepresentable presence of being, the unconditional witness to which or to whom I seek to be open, is not by any concept, though we may chart some of the territory by tactically negating certain key concepts, but by a return to narrative. Thus, we could see, for example, the parables of Jesus as representations of the unconditional presence in that they display situations in which the choices made turn out to be choices as to whether or not to continue being open to the grace of the unspoken and unsystematized. We could see the parable of Jesus' own life and death as precisely the narrative that Jesus' own stories lead up to, the displaying of the consequences of having the unconditional spoken and enacted in a human life. And the normative narrative of Christian discipleship 
is one of growing in the recognition that in our relation with the narrated figure of Jesus, we are growing in our exposure to the infinite resource of God, the reality or presence that has no interest to pursue and no selfhood to defend, but is witness. That's as may be. The philosophical argument alone is not going to take us there. But I've been trying to suggest that some philosophical argument can show where the language of grace or absolution or transfiguration may appear as an intelligible way of going on. Once you have accepted the finite position of a speaker whose work as speaker is always incomplete, always inviting something else. And it's important also to note what the problems may be if that religious register is forgotten. Cavell has an interesting passage towards the end of the claim of reason, where he looks at the long-term effect of ceasing to think about a creator of the universe. He writes, we are still stuck with the idea of the human being as a creature, meaning a living thing, something procreated, but meaning equally something created. And so he says, we either abandon the resonances of the word created, thus naturalizing human identity as part of an indifferent order, or else we install ourselves as self-creators in God's place. Yet however hard we try to locate ourselves solely in a natural order, we cannot help rediscovering ourselves in some ways over against nature, whether, he says, whether for Descartes' reasons or for Rousseau's or for Kant's or for Blake's or for Wordsworth's or for Marx's or for Thoreau's. And however hard we try to see ourselves as authors of ourselves, we cannot accept that our present state is what we have desired. We are apt, says Cavell, to turn upon our creation in anger as, according to us, and who knows this better, as the creator did. Connecting this specifically to what we are arguing about language, we could say that it is the lived complexity of our position as language users that pulls us away from a naturalizing strategy and also warns us against the myths of self-creation. And it is, it is indeed our language use that steers us away from the pathologies Cavell diagnoses. <clears throat> if so, there seems to be some connection between language itself and the acknowledgement of a creator, as if the sense of finitude and dependence, combined with the sense of not being a determined vehicle of natural processes, were inextricably involved in using words in the way we do. To labour the point again, this is not an open and shut argument for an extramental, non-finite reality. But it is a way of identifying whether concepts and images of theology and religious belief touch the basic questions about how we make sense of what we as humans characteristically do. We speak because we're in search of recognition. We want to be heard and understood. And on the basis of what we've said so far about understanding itself, this must mean that we want to have opened for us the possibility of new kinds of shared action, new ways of going on in the company of others. In seeking to be heard and changed by whatever presence it is that doesn't compete or exclude, that doesn't behave as if it were another agent or subject like myself. I'm also seeking to open myself to a kind of agency that's active beyond the plain realm of specific causal processes. We represent this only with the greatest risk and difficulty, and we habitually trivialize it by trying to display it as another and more effective causal factor in the world, a power that can override any other power. But what we want to say is something more like a claim that there will be for any imaginable future we could have, a context of grace, of absolution and renewal for our failures, and of growing alignment with such an agency so that we become channels of its absolving and renewing operations. We'll see in the fifth lecture that there are aspects of language that will press us hard to think about matters like grace, mercy, and trust. And the way in which a theological account of language warns us off the toxic territories of both self-creation and reductionism opens up the vital issue of how a robust and coherent understanding of language is freighted with significant moral and political insight. <clears throat>
I noted in the last of these lectures that I was rather obviously trying to speak, trying not to speak too glibly of a world beyond language, if only to avoid a not very helpful dualism between word and world, as if speakers didn't really belong in the world. <clears throat> and that, that's a fallacy that encourages us to think of language as the labeling of a passive environment. I think my argument so far should show why I'm, I'm unhappy with that dualism of word and world, that sense that we, whoever we are, are somehow at a privileged distance from the environment we inhabit. But the unfinishedness of language, the fact of never having said a last word, and of seeking to continue a practice, a habit, will not allow us easily to settle down with an account of language that treats it as a purely self-generated thing. The difficulties of language are bound up with the fact that one aspect of what we recognize in each other as speakers is a shared agenda of wrestling with what belongs to neither of us. And as we shall see more fully later on, this, when explored further, gives us some purchase on what we might mean by the sacred. <clears throat> it is as if, and I know this is awkwardly vague at this point, as if all our speaking is done in the wake of a given quality in what we encounter, as if we were always catching up with a reality never seen as standing still enough to be absorbed or fully embraced or mastered. I referred earlier to Cavell's faintly embarrassed comment on what is happening in tragic drama and the knowledge it brings. It is by responding to this knowledge that the community keeps itself in touch with nature, brackets, with being, I would say, if I knew how. What Cavell is pointing to is something like this. As spectators of drama, we suspend our capacity to act, to join in the practice, to go on as we watch. We give over this time to a recognition of the inaccessible otherness of what is done on the stage. And it's this that keeps the community attentive to what it is itself, what it is that gives its identity, gives it its identity as a community. Paradoxically, a community of speakers recognizes itself as such a community when it finds the ritual that enacts its character as a unity of separate speakers who will never be able simply to stand in each other's place. The ritual of suspending action and response declares that we must regularly and consciously acknowledge together that we live in incompleteness of understanding, that we are not transparent to each other, and that this, so far from being a handicap, is the guarantee of love or attention or respect or whatever we want to say about that hesitation before each other that guards us against eating one another up in one mode of fantasy or another. We are put in touch with being in the sense that we come to see ourselves as limited, as opaque to each other, as always summoned to the search for the shared practice that's entailed in understanding. And so as located in a context we cannot master and must approach with receptive care. That we do not know how to name being is an inevitable corollary of how we speak. Being is both the condition of where and how we are and that which never comes into view as an object for the perceiving mind. But if, between or beyond speakers, there appears a datum to which both are in some sense accountable, to which both seek to do justice, that appearing opens out ultimately onto the horizon of an agency that has no reaction, no conditioning, and is therefore, as we noted earlier, beyond any notion of rivalry. And once we have found not a descriptive account of being, but a means of mapping where questions about it enter our discourse, we have a new level of access to self-questioning, to the tools that bring us back to realism and humility about who and how we are. It is this gesturing towards what appears beyond and between speakers engaged in the unceasing exchanges of language that grounds our knowledge of ourselves as distinctively human, both radically limited and radically innovative. The recognition that we do not possess or contain one another is one of the conditions of community. <clears throat> 
The difficulty we have in being transparent to one another is not a handicap, but a grace. And thinking our way into what this implies may begin to open us to what is involved in claiming that there is an otherness to all our particular othernesses, grounding this entire project of speaking with one another. But to speak of limitedness draws us back to considerations of what it is for us to speak as bodily agents or subjects. And in the first of next week's lectures, I want to examine how our location as bodies fills out the themes sketched in the argument so far, reinforcing a recognition that our speech is necessarily both collaborative and incomplete. And in the light of this, I want to look briefly at some of those near metaphysical or parametaphysical proposals that have come from certain areas in the philosophy of science, and that yet again bring us up against the question of what it is that can't be described, yet invites representation of the kind we've been thinking about. Thank you very much. <laughs> Custom, we shall pause for two or three minutes to enable those of you who have to get away to do so, after which there will be a period of around 15 minutes for questions and discussion. I was really interested in the way in which you talked about drama and ritual, and the way, and to, to put it back to the seductions of reductionism, which somebody asked you about um, last time, because one could view books or writing as digitized speech. That is to say, make it firm, make it finite, make it certain so you don't move beyond and anything like that. And the interesting thing when, when, when you talked about drama was that it occurred to me that somehow well, drama was, the thing about drama was that it was, of course, moving, it, it had the script, but it kept talking and different, different things. Now, ritual was somewhat different because it, it was more rigid, as it were, because it has to be. And I thought then of things like music, mm -hmm. like, like the difference between a classical piece and jazz, um, where there's obviously more moves for interpretation and, and, and things like that. But also, in respect of speech and lecturing, then what's the relationship between your script and the book that will come out of it and what you say now? Mm. Because, it, because, because at some levels, you see, it seems to me is, is that if we think of the book as drama, we don't perform it unless we speak it in the way in which you do. Because otherwise, when we interpret, you might think of it as interpret, every time we read the book, we interpret it in a different way, but we interpret it in words, and we interpret it in writing, and that still fixes it in a way. So I just wonder if you've got any comments mm. about that. Thank you very much. That's extremely interesting. Um, Lots I'd like to pick up there. Uh, just a couple of things um, while I try to come to terms with, with some fascinating ideas there. One is about um, what is sometimes a slight superstition that speaking or writing is somehow fixing a more determinate um, understanding of language than, than we really need to the sort of Derridean position that there's, you know, there's something slightly sinister about writing, or that it, you know, it both transforms and undermines. Um, I'm very wary of that, because I think written texts are so often, as you hint, texts for performance in one way or another. Even my reading of a, a very abstract text is a sort of performance. I am I'm, at least if you read books as I read books, you don't necessarily read every word. Um, you may be reconstructing an argument as you go on. You may be rehearsing a voice almost as you read. And I think when there is a relationship of some sort between a spoken text and a written one, that's simply an extreme case of the fact that as we read, we do engage in a kind of performance, perhaps. Um, it's, it's also, I think, important that Even, yes, that when the written text is there, the drama, the novel, the poem, even the, you know, 
the book, even philosophy of religion or whatever. Um, its being there as a, as a text does not, in fact, end, end the discussion. In some way, it's the writer letting go of certain kinds of control so that there can be response. I, I notice as I deliver a written text, I think, I can't say that, or what on earth did I mean by that? Or I'll have to go back to that bit. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's, there's an inner conversation going on. And I guess that's what a lot of um, novelists and poets feel as well. There's quite a discussion about the relation between poetry as text and poetry as performance. And I, I tend to come down on the performance side of it. That's another long story. So we're going to move across to the third row. I'd like to pick up the word performance and give it its Austinian sense. Um, it seems to me that one of the things you were saying was when we're trying to know who we are or what we are, we have, in fact, to give priority to the acknowledgement rather than knowledge. Mm -hmm. That is to say that knowledge presupposes something like acknowledgement, which is a performative, mm -hmm. something that one brings about in saying something. But what the context of that what you yourself say um, adds to that is that we may have to break away from the idea that acknowledgement is final and outside time. Mm -hmm. uh, that it is also too developmental and requires uh, renewal mm -hmm. or recreation, if you wish. Do you agree? Mm. Very much so, thank you. Um, the Austinian reference, of course, is, is not at all surprising given Cavell's immense debt to Austin and the fact that the first part of the claim of reason is largely a discussion of Austin on some of these matters. And yes, I, I think I would say acknowledgement itself is always something that we continue to, in the language I've been using, negotiate in some ways. There can be um, provisional, imperfect, revisable, corrigible, forms of acknowledgement, they, they unfold. They're not, as you say, timeless, so I, I take that very much on board. Um, I wonder if I could just ask you to explore a little, um, Dr. Williams, the relationship between languages unfinished and claims of truth. Um, is it possible or sensible to attempt to make a claim of truth however um, cautiously we make it. This is, I think, one of the questions that, that's bound to keep coming up in a, a discussion of this thought. Um, quite often we work with what I think is a mistaken polarity between um, truth which must be, in some sense, pinned down in final form and relativism. As we were reflecting the other night, there are certain ways in which you can talk about cumulative understanding, where acknowledgement, if you like, continues in a consistent manner, where you can say, it really does look as if having over generations rubbed your hand over, over the grain, it still feels as if it's flowing in the same direction. And part of, part of the interest I have from the theological point of view, is what it means to make truth claims about, let's say, the Christian creeds. And I would, I think, go back again and again there to what some have said about creedal language, that it would be very rash indeed to claim that this gave you definitive insight into the inner life of God. It would be equally rash to say that you might as well say anything. <laughs> Um, and the definition I've occasionally used of Christian doctrine is that these are the least silly things Christians have found to say about God. <laughs> um, in other words, they're surrounded by that intrinsic sort of critical caution, saying, well, you know, this, this is the grammar we want to specify. This is the field within which we're working. And gradually over generations of theological argument, certain things fall off the radar. <laughs> And that's, you know, that is a truth claim. Mm 
you're going to take two from over here, one in the fifth row and then one in the front row. Thank you, Dr. Williams. A um, fascinating lecture, one that reminds me of Heidegger's claim that language is the house of being. It's a tight connection. Um, so you, you talked a lot about um, the way the un unfinishedness of discourse as it unfolds between the speaker and another. But I'm curious about um, the nature of what is left unsaid. Are they because it's seen that it need not be said, that it's already understood between both parties, or that it must not be said, an utterance that for some reason has a power? Um, how does that unfold over time? Mm. Mm. That's, uh, that's a very good question. And I, I think that possibly some of what I, I'm coming to in the last lecture may touch a bit on that, on different kinds of silences. Um, it's a very interesting one because I, there are things we need not say because we're confident that something in the nature of the exchange or the relationship supplies the gaps. We, as it were, leap from um, leaf pad to leaf pad um, because we, the, the level of trust or understanding is such that, etc. And the things that we must not say that's a very interesting area because, again, there are relationships which survive by avoidance, survive by denial, and if you say certain things, you, you know, they are wrecked. There are relationships that, I mean, we're not saying that they, they survive by denial, but that in some sense, saying something even if true would breach whatever contact is possible. And I'm thinking here of the, the kind of pastoral context where, I'm speaking as a priest, um, I know perfectly well that in some pastoral situations it's not much good simply coming out with what you believe passionately to be theologically true because to say it would somehow foreclose somebody else's trust or capacity to keep talking or to keep listening. Um, so there, there are many cases there which I think are very interesting and I'll touch on it a bit, I promise, later on. Okay. <clears throat> I think my question relates to the previous two. You made this important argument that there's no pure repetition. Mm. And I couldn't help but wonder if there's the corollary is that there's no pure creation, that there's no genuinely new moves in language. And I just wonder mm. if this is a problem mm. for a theology which wants to speak of, uh, it, to say, in the beginning was the word. I wonder whether, if language is always time-bound, how can there be an eternal word? Oh, that's very interesting. Um, first response is to be um, irritatingly pedantic and say that, of course, logos means more than language, which you know as well as I do. Um, and what is interesting is that, of course, not only in Christianity, but in Islam, in Hindu speculation, the notion that what creates is, as it were, a single fundamental utterance or self-externalizing of the divine, which then in the Hindu phrase echoes in the cave of being. And that, and that is clearly saying that the fundamental reality on which we all depend is the communication of meaning. But precisely because of that, back to my argument in the lecture tonight, precisely because of that, it can't be an act of communication among others. It can't be a, a staking, a negotiating, and so forth. Though when the word becomes flesh, or when the word becomes audible in history, then of course um, there are elements of the risky, the temporal about it. And as um, Ida Goris, the German Catholic theologian of the 30s noted, for God to communicate to a Bronze Age tribal culture is for God to take a considerable risk because, and to put it extremely crudely, when God communicates to a Bronze Age tribal culture, what emerges is a Bronze Age tribal God. Or at least that's the risk. And how is it that the reality of God's communication to that Bronze Age tribal culture somehow squeezes itself through the, the narrow funnel 
Bronze Age tribal goddery to become part of a, a larger narrative which we now call Christian scripture or Hebrew and Christian scripture. So um, I think I'd go back to the, you know, the basic point. Whatever it is that actually speaks language itself into being isn't itself an act of communication. So we can still, I think, hold those, those two um, pictures of a fundamental creative utterance and of utterances as being time-bound and risky. Um, I, I think we've, we might have time for one more question or two. Um, let, let's go to Donald first. And I, I've also got somebody up here and maybe let you have the last word. My, my question is less profound than the last one. Um, when you mentioned a repetition and that you would go and watch a play that you've seen many times before because you want to experience again and find out what, to understand more. In, some, in each Easter, I would dwell on the passion story to try to understand something more about what's going on. But also, there are books I read or films I see or whatever again and again because I just want to experience a certain part of it again without particularly wanting to learn anything more, or I just because I just like watching Eric Little winning the 400 bridges or whatever it is that Elizabeth Bennett says next. But also, sometimes the mere act of repetition is itself creating something new. In the Monty Python um, episode, no one expects the Spanish Inquisition becomes funnier every time it's said yes. until right at the end when it misses the cue and is finished. The sort of, it turns a whole idea of repetition completely upside down. I just wonder, you know, can you reflect on what's going on in those different situations? <laughs> a theology of Monty Python, yes. Um, first of all, yes, I mean, there, there is a sense in which we go back to a familiar text or whatever, hoping to reconnect with something important, or where, um, for example, if you're watching the Wales-England rugby match in Cardiff this March, you may very well, as you see it on the DVD, say, I really want to see that one again. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the fact is, of course, that even when you press the repeat button straight away, you're not quite the same person. And the experience you're seeking to rehearse, to repeat, is not going to be quite the same thing. Of course it, it's not. And I remember very vividly a friend of mine at uh, college being uh, encountered in the library one day by one of our um, lecturers who asked him what he was reading. And my friend told him, and the lecturer said, I'm very sorry to hear that. Why is that, said my friend? Because, said the lecturer, you'll never have the delight of reading it again for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is rather profound in its way. Um, as for repetition and... Um, that particular kind of humor, in a sense that, that really makes the point. Every repetition accumulates expectation and the accumulated expectation that is finally overthrown is all the more powerful because of it. Okay, we're going to take two more questions and I'll ask you to be very brief since we're running out of time rapidly. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much for, for this series of lectures. Um, unfortunately, my question is even less profound than the previous two gentlemen before me, because uh, <laughs> it's spoken from a student. So, uh, and simply the question is, and then I'll explain where the question's coming from, is how do we avoid using empty language with talking about important things? And the reason that I ask this is because whenever myself or, or friends that I know come to maybe lectures like this or read, you know, philosophy or critical theory. On the one hand, we feel something very important is being said here, and I really, really need to understand it. And on the other hand, we have the slight suspicion that nothing's really being said at all. And there's just, you know, big fancy words, you know, to hide the fact that yeah. it's empty. Uh, so how do we avoid using empty language to talk about important things? Wow. Oh. <laughs> you think that's not profound? 
I don't wholly know how to answer that because it's, it's the kind of thing which famously Bonhoeffer writes about in his prison letters. Why do we go on using this theological language when it doesn't actually change anything? And what he says there is not, you know, not that the language is untrue or false, but you have got to rein in, ask what you're going to do, find those few spare words that can again just sort of give you a, a trajectory over, over the difficulty, over the silence. And look out for those things which, which are constructively difficult and you know, don't, don't gloss over them. So I suppose the only, the only way you could really decide about a lecture like this would be, and I'm not suggesting the answer is obvious, you know, ask, is, is, it a dif is the difficulty of it generative? Is it difficult or is it glib? Is it, you know, does it make you do some work? Um, perhaps that's, that's the bottom line. Does language about difficult, complex subjects does it make you do, do the work? Um, and sometimes, of course, the less that's said, the more constructive work gets done. So how do you avoid using language too easily, constant exposure of what you say to people who, who you trust, constant examination of whether it makes any difference, of whether it creates constructive difficulty or just mystification. And there's plenty of mystification around. Final question. We've got the microphone too. You defined um, repetition as a form of not understanding. You also defined ritual as a form of repetition. Does that therefore mean <laughs> that ritual is a form of not understanding? Ah, thank you. Um, no, not quite, <coughs> because I think what I was trying to say is that plain repetition, the mouse in the kitchen, um, we may we may start on the assumption that it is just repetition. We're just saying the same thing. In fact, we're not. And trying to say the same thing is something we're always going to fail in. It'll be somebody else talking, another moment will have elapsed, the situation will have changed. So there's never going to be simple repetition, but there are forms of you know, understood, deliberate, re rehearsing, repeating, which because we know what we're doing, allow us to say that through the same, what appears to be the same vehicle, different experiences, different situations are being processed or, or transformed. Something like that, I think. Well, we draw to a close again, but uh, before we do so, let me thank Lord Williams once again for a beautifully crafted and highly stimulating lecture, which we will look forward to reading as well as to hearing in order to understand more fully in due course. Uh, we're grateful to him also, I, I should say, for the, the added value he's giving us at these sessions and the, the Q&A time. And uh, he has responded very graciously to a wide range of questions once again this evening. I had hoped to say to you that Lord Williams will now be having a well-earned rest over the weekend, but I believe he has speaking engagements in South Wales and Cambridge to fulfill. We do, however, look forward to his return to Edinburgh next week and to the fourth of his series, which will be here on Monday, the 11th of November at 5.30, the title Material World Words, Language as Physicality. You are all very welcome to return next week, and we look forward to hearing from Lord Williams once again. Please thank him. <clears throat> This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.